someone out there is getting richer as the government gets poorer, as they borrow more money. And of course, when they get richer, they look at asset allocation and they say, I only want so much in treasuries. I only want so much in equities. I only want so much in gold. I only want so much in this asset. I only want so much in heirlooms and so on, so much in property. So they, they're asset allocating. So as the government goes deeper into debt, it means due to the asset allocation policies of billions of people around the planet, the price of assets in general will tend to rise. And obviously, uh, the rarer and more desired the asset is, the faster, the further and faster it will rise. But of course, it does have an impact on retail prices as well, because there are there are components in the retail price index which are uh, consumer price index which are rare. As an, one example is labor, the cost of labor. You know, the the, the labor you put into make, even though if you buy a, a pizza in your supermarket, it was almost certainly made by robots in a factory untouched by human hand but someone probably had to put it on the shelf someone had to drive it to the to the supermarket so there is a labor component um uh, which does mean that to some extent retail prices will be rising as well but they're not going to be rising as fast as the inflation of the fiat money uh the fiat uh, money is rising. Uh, it's it's around ten percent a year at the moment. That number is likely to rise. Uh, so I would say the real inflation rate, if you take everything into account, the the expansion of the monetary base on the planet is around ten percent. On this episode of What the Finance Podcast, I have the pleasure of welcoming back Clive Thompson. Uh, so Clive spent his entire career uh, in wealth management, mainly Swiss private banking, which was close to 47 years. Uh, and he has a really unique insight into, I guess, what's happening in central banking as well as uh, macroeconomics globally. So Clive, thanks so much for joining the podcast today. Well, Anthony, thank you very much for having me on your show. I do see that your subscriber numbers are rising quite nicely. So well done to you. Yeah, thanks so much, because I get to uh, speak to really interesting people like yourself. And I think it's, uh, you know, more people are be becoming aware of what's happening in the world, which is, uh, you know, really important thing. Um, yeah, it's, it's quite interesting. I was looking back at our re last conversation, and it was actually during the, uh, you know, banking crisis last March, when everyone was quite worried about uh, rising yields and, uh, you know, banks defaulting and uh, the risk of that sort of spreading globally. We didn't see that happening. Fed came in, sort of backstopped the whole thing with uh, trillions of dollars. Uh, and yeah, everything seemed to be fine since then. So I guess from your perspective, is, is that the correct way to look at it or, or what really happened uh, during the banking crisis I, I, and afterwards? Um, I don't think we are facing a major banking crisis, nor were we uh, a year ago. We were facing some defaults. Uh, and there'd be less than I expected. Uh, I think we will see some American banking failures going forwards, particularly the smaller regional banks, which are focused on mortgages. Uh, the The real problem the banking sector had and still has, and it's not gone away, is the problem of borrowing short term. That is, they take money from their depositors and they have to repay them at, at notice and lending long term. So when they lend long term, they've done two types, two or three types of things. The first one is the mortgages. So these mortgages will be 5, 10, 20, 30 years, depends on the country. Uh, I think in America, it's quite long-term mortgages. In the UK, it's much shorter where they fix it maybe for four or five years. Uh, the second thing is they're lending to corporations who quite obviously can't immediately pay where they borrowed money to buy a factory or whatever they're doing. Uh, so that, to all intents and purposes, is long-term lending. And typically, corporations will want to have a fixed interest rate for a number of years, so they, they'll have fixed the interest rate there. Uh, the uh, third type of lending they'll have done, uh, oh, sorry, so third type of investing, which is when they uh, deploy their assets, will have been to put it into government bonds. Now, all of that will have happened over the last decade uh, when interest rates were as close to zero as makes no difference, which means the interest rate that they are earning on these fixed interest loans is quite low. Uh, certainly it's lower than what they have to pay their depositors to keep the money in the bank. Now, many depositors don't care, they're leaving their money and earning nothing. But realistically speaking, there's an ongoing movement by depositors to say, you know, I can get 5% in a money market fund. I'm taking my money out of here and I'm going to put it in a money market fund. And the money market fund would be putting their money in the USA, for example, with the Federal Reserve, where they can get 5% and completely safely. 
Uh, so the, the banks have got this situation that they have short-term depositors who they have to repay at notice, and they have these long-term loans which they can't get back at, at short notice. Uh, they are... If they sell their liquid assets, which are the treasury bonds that, that they'll own, they're going to be selling them at below the price they paid, which is a loss. And the the problem with this is to what uh, with banks is to what extent are the losses that banks have made on these treasury bonds, on their loans, on their commercial real estate loans, on all the loans they made? To what extent are those assets, because they are assets of the bank, whether the bank lends money? To what extent are those assets worth less than the deposits, their liabilities that they've taken in? Um, if the difference is greater than their capital reserves, then the bank is insolvent and some sort of action needs to be taken. Um, and that might mean it goes into administration and the Federal Reserve deposit, uh, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation steps in and provides compensation for the investors who want their money out. And maybe the, the bank gets taken over by a larger bank. But so the, the problem is out there, and the I think the, the growing problem is in the arena of the commercial real estate market. Uh, we're seeing that there's a continuing reluctance of employees to go back to work. So office buildings, perhaps are only 60% occupancy in terms of number of staff that they had before, and that has an impact on the entire infrastructure around the, the office buildings. So where you have office buildings, you also have many other businesses from supermarkets to hairdressers, to gyms, to fast food, to restaurants and so on. And all of these businesses will be seeing a reduced footfall because of the reduced number of people going to work because 40% of them perhaps are working at home. The landlords of these businesses and that's not just the offices, but the also all the businesses around will be fine as long as the tenants continue to pay the lease payments, which will be typically fixed for three, five, ten, sometimes even 20 years. But when those leases mature, many of the tenants are going to say either it doesn't make sense for me anymore. Perhaps I'm a hairdresser and I haven't got the footfall I used to have or a fast food restaurant. Or maybe you're a, uh, an office where you had four floors and now you only need two floors because you don't have so many people in the office from day to day, and even those who are in there are hot desking with the in the new world as much as a hot desk than it was in the past. So the demand by the owners, by the occupiers of the real estate is going to go down in terms of number of floors they're going to take. They're not going to pay and not going to be willing to pay the same rent as they were paying previously. So that has an impact on the landlords who are going to have, as these leases mature, they're going to have less income less rent coming in the door. It's going to be much harder to rent those places out to new tenants. Maybe they can at lower rents. But if the rents coming in are much lower and they've got interest rates going out or interest going out of the door in terms of their fixed term loan, well, we know what's happened to interest rates. They have gone up. They weren't close to zero. Uh, at, the, at the headline level, they're 5%. Of course, you're paying more than that when you borrow money from a bank. But for every landlord, when his loan matures, the interest rate at the moment will be higher than it was when he fixed the rate, which means we have a double whammy here. We have rents going down for the landlord, and for the landlord, we have his costs going up, his interest rate, which means to all intents and purposes, some landlords won't be able to pay the interest, and others will say it's not worth the biscuit, and they're, you know, I'm, I'm now not making the kind of return I expected. My real estate is not worth what I paid for it. Uh, and I think that a lot of the real estate might be worth less than the security the bank took on it so when a bank lends money on a on a commercial building or a, a property they might lend 50 60 70 percent uh maybe more for a house probably a lot more for a house but certainly for a commercial property maybe 50 60 70 percent maybe 80 percent in some extreme cases i'm quite sure that many of those properties are worth a lot less than the bank lent and therefore some of those properties some of those landlords are going to default not all i mean the, the ones who can afford to pay the rent, but uh, have a legal obligation to do so, so that they won't default. But some of them are uh, wrapped up in uh, holding companies and that sort of thing. And it would make sense for them just to simply hand back the keys to the bank and say, thank you very much. Uh, the company which borrowed the money is now bankrupt. Do what you want. Uh, so that means that the banks will have in the coming year, years, losses, realized losses on those real estate loans. And in some cases, 
And I don't think it's a lot of cases, but I think it'll be in some cases, it will mean that it will wipe out their equity and we will have some uh, banking failures. And that's when the FDIC steps in and the Federal Reserve steps in to arrange a merger with another bank. Uh, I think my message is because of the dangers in the banking system, and I don't want to make people think this is an extreme danger, but it is a danger. I wouldn't keep more than you need to keep in a bank for your foreseeable needs in the future in terms of cash. I mean, it's perfectly right to have your securities in the bank. So if you have bonds or equities or gold or some other asset held by the bank, that's fine because they're not on the bank's balance sheet. But the minute you have cash on your current account, that's a liability of the bank on their balance sheet. And if the bank defaults, Yes, you'll get paid if you meet the FDIC limited America or the uh, guarantee in various countries around Europe, because every country has got a guarantee for its banking system. But only to the extent that the guarantee corporation has enough funds, and they do have enough funds for a small number of bankruptcies. But if it turns out to be more, then you might find you're not getting 100% of your money. Um, so I don't think it's a big danger. I don't want to scare people too much here, but I just think I wouldn't keep more than necessary in the banks. Yeah, no, thanks for running us through that. And it is quite interesting uh, sort of how it's gone to the situation. As you said, it's more of a slow burn there as, uh, you know, people have to re-mortgage re or um, when, when people default. But it's quite interesting because I think there was this hope that, uh, you know, interest rates would decrease you know inflation would come down that uh that would be the savior and then sort of once these uh you know uh, institutions or uh, owners had to remortgage it would be at a lower rate but uh we're seeing now that there's a concern that inflation is a bit stickier you know energy prices have increased so it seems like maybe that uh light at the end of the tunnel is sort of darkening a, a bit more than previously so the, uh, a month or so ago, the consensus on Wall Street that was that we'd see three rate cuts in 2024. Uh, they're all backtracking on that. And uh, there's quite a few people who now think there won't be any rate cuts. But one has to distinguish between the short-term interest rate, which is the Fed fund rate, and the rate on longer-term instruments like 10-year treasuries. The interest rate on 10-year treasuries is far more influential on long-term lending rates than the short-term Fed funds rate. The Fed fund rate is, is great for people who are borrowing overnight and need a bit of liquidity and they're going to repay it tomorrow or next week. But most, most borrowers want to have a fixed rate for a long term. And what we're seeing is a rise in the yield on the 10-year and the 20-year and the five-year, actually, uh, treasury bonds. And that it has an impact on the rates at which people can borrow when their loans mature. So maturing loans the interest rate on them is higher than two weeks ago, simply because the yield on treasury bonds is rising. I think we're at 4.5 on the 10 year and 4 point or 4.6 on the 10 year, maybe 4.7, 4.6 on the 20 year. Uh, that's up from just above four a couple of months ago. So you can see the rates are creeping upwards. And there was, I, I, I see that, I think it was, uh, people thought that the front end of the curve would sort of go down and that would, uh, you know, reinvert the uh sort of yield curve back to a to a normal level but it seems like maybe it's the opposite way maybe the long end is going to actually increase further and that that way it will un unvert but uh yeah it's quite interesting to see yeah i, I saw that uh mr powell backtracked a little bit yesterday and, and once again went into in the line interest rates might have to stay high for longer uh whereas the mantra had previously moved to we're heading in the direction we just need to see a little bit more evidence. Um, he's now kind of accepting that evidence isn't there. And, uh, and unfortunately for him, he hasn't got a lot to go on to reduce inflation because inflation is proving quite sticky. And the other side of the coin, which is their dual mandate, which is employment numbers. So far, the official employment numbers, and you can believe them or not believe them, but the official number on which he's working is very robust. It's showing that there's a lot of new jobs in the United States. Uh, the economy doesn't seem to care about interest rates. Uh, we had a, a, a figure out yesterday, I forget what it was, but it was a, another very a consumer consumption or something like that. It was a very robust figure. It was stronger than people expected. And it shows the economy is doing well. So he can't cut rates on the grounds of 
keeping full employment at the moment and he can't cut rates on the grounds of inflation because inflation isn't actually going down anymore it's going up again yeah so do you, do you think that we will see sticky inflation moving forward stickier than expected the fed has benefited in the last few months from uh calendar effects because after the invasion of ukraine by russia the commodity prices rose a lot and those commodity prices on the futures exchanges have more or less come back to normal uh so that meant over the last year, so the evasion sort of happened in 21, I think it was, but, and then February 21, uh, and commodity prices were sort of peaking around the middle of year, late year of 21, which meant that the numbers which were coming out during 22 and early 23 were showing a decline in the inflation, or they were helping inflation not rise as fast. But that's that calendar effect has gone away now. Um, so I've got a feeling that uh, inflation is going to the the official rate of increase is going to stay quite sticky, um, with employment being so robust officially. Uh, perhaps that will also mean that salaries aren't going to or wages are not going to drop, and I guess wages are a component of the inflation index in some way because it feeds through to retail prices. So I'm not I'm not really expecting a fall in pr inflation, but of course, if we do have a sudden drop in commodity prices like the oil price, um, that will feed through eventually, but not uh, not instantly. Yeah, but it seems like uh, say if inflation even stays higher for these next few months, it's going to be bad for as we mentioned, yields are going to go up. It's going to be bad for the banks who actually hold these assets because the uh, you know. The value of those assets of uh, the bonds are going to go down. So, do you think it will put these banks under more pressure, or are they are there enough backs yes. in place where that oh, it will? It will put yeah, it'll put banks under more pressure. I mean, I think the whole world is under pressure in a certain sense from higher rates. Um, let, let's start with the Federal Reserve on its own. Um, the Federal Reserve is getting deeper and deeper into the insolvency hole they're they're very insolvent at the moment due to the fact that for more than a year they have been paying much higher interest rates to their depositors that's the banks and the money market funds who deposit money with the federal reserve than they're earning on the book of treasuries that they bought over the last decade when interest rates were much lower so they're now well over a trillion dollars uh in uh losses uh now because of unusual rules at the Federal Reserve and the accounting book, which they have written themselves, by the way, they're allowed to call losses assets. That's official. Now, if any corporate, any company was to call a loss an asset, uh, that would be criminal and the directors would go to jail. But that is legally allowed. It's in the um, uh, Federal Reserve's accounting manual, which I've, I've read the relevant section. Um, and that accounting manual is written by the board of directors or approved by the board of directors themselves. Uh, but if there were a, if they were a company, they'd be deeply insolvent and have, probably have to go into administration. But that's uh, or or bankruptcy or, insol or insolvency or bankruptcy. But that's not the case with the Federal Reserve. And we mustn't forget that in theory, they have the ability to build print unlimited amounts of money. Um, it's not as simple as that, but I, I give that sort of very generically. Uh, but the the reality is it's going to take a long time for them to recover their insolvency. And the only way or the main way to recover the insolvency would be to lower short-term rates so that the short-term rates are lower than the interest they're earning on their book of treasury bonds. But even then, if they do that, that'll take a very long time to recover. Or the alternative is to wait for another decade or so as their book of treasury bonds and uh, notes mature and they reinvest them at the new higher rates. But that still only works if we have a positive yield curve, i.e. bond yields are higher than the short-term interest rate. And that's not the case today. Uh, it probably will be the case, I think, probably before the end of this year, because I think it's not the short-term rates which will come down so much, it's more the longer-term rates which will rise. And the reason they're going to rise is the second uh, party who has an interest in lower interest rates, and that's the Treasury. Now, the Treasury is the arm of the government which borrows money when the government spends more money than it collects in taxes. And that's what the government has been doing almost forever. 
but certainly to a huge extent since the 2008 crisis and even more so as a result of the COVID crisis and onwards. So in the United States, we have a situation where the expenditure exceeds the collection of taxes by around two trillion a year. So they're collecting, let's say, four trillion a year in taxes. That's very rough and ready. They're spending around six trillion and that's rising. So the gap, the budget deficit, or the deficit, if you like, is getting wider. It's exceeding, the, the deficit is exceeding the official budget uh, because, as always, there's always going to be some emergencies they've got to spend money on, which aren't, isn't in the, in the official budget. And when you spend more than you earn in taxes, you have to borrow the difference. It's just like if you have a salary of 1000 you're spending 2000 you have to borrow an extra 1000 a month. So that, that's the reason the government debt is getting bigger by the day. And as I said, it's going up by about $2 trillion a year. It's $34 trillion today. Uh, in a year's time, it'll be $36 trillion and so on. And the, the problem with the government uh, debt, and we're coming back again to interest rates, is that the interest rates, when the government borrows money, the treasury, that's the treasury in this case, when the treasury borrows money, the interest rate is much higher than it was over the last decade. Because over the last decade, you could borrow money at 1% or 2 or, or eventually 3%. Now they're having to borrow money at four or five. Well, it's 4.6% 4, 4. if you like, if you take the 10-year. So they're having to borrow at a much higher rate of interest. And that means that the interest cost is rising rapidly as a percentage of everything the government spends. I, I think it's around 14% of the government expenditure at the moment, but that's, right, that, that's double what it was a year ago. So the interest cost is rising rapidly and... Within a decade, and probably this decade, if things carry on as they are, the interest cost will exceed the totality of all the taxes collected by the United States each year. Uh, so if I put that in simple language, as if it was a, uh, an individual, uh, it's as if he's borrowing on his credit cards, and he's juggling his credit cards, but there comes a point where the interest on those credit cards is exceeding what he's earning, and there's, it's only a question of time before some bank somewhere says, I'm not going to lend you any more money. Now, let's look at it from the Treasury point of view. Of course, there is a lender of the last resort, and that is the Federal Reserve. They haven't done that yet, and they don't necessarily need to do that yet. But if we get to a point where the buyers, the traditional buyers of Treasury bonds start to get indigestion, and I get the impression that's happening already because we see... Uh, a decline in the treasury holdings by a number of central banks. They're switching more to gold than treasuries. If the if the normal buyers of treasury bonds, which would be pension funds all around the world, investment funds all around the world, central banks around the world, and private investors, if people start to get indigestion, say, you know, I have enough of these, they have to pay higher interest rates to make the next guy borrow some money. Because if I bought, if I had enough treasuries at four and a half percent, and I don't really want any more, well, I might buy another one if I could get five percent, maybe. I, mean, I wouldn't, but uh, <laughs> there will be people out there who would. But that indigestion can grow and grow and grow, and if it grows too much, then they get into what's called a debt spiral, where the price of treasury bonds is falling rapidly. Uh, what we don't normally talk about bonds falling, we more talk about yields rising. So the yield on the existing bonds is rising rapidly, and it becomes more and more expensive to borrow money to finance the deficit, which means it spirals out of control. Uh, that's not going to happen because the Federal Reserve, at some point, will do its duty and step in. They have no choice. They, you know, they, it'd be a, a situation of. Uh, a, a, a current a currency failure, uh, a treasury market failure, and the inability of the government to pay its debts. So the Federal Reserve, when this happens, will step in. But how does the Federal Reserve step in? Well, there's only one way for it to step in, and that is to print money to buy the treasury bonds. So at some point, that is what's going to happen. And uh, in the old school of economics, we always used to say the, the more you increase the money supply, the higher the inflation rate goes. Um, that's still true, but realistically speaking, the in the modern world, because treasuries are so liquid, it's almost like cash itself. Um, 
we have the money supply increasing if you include the treasury debt, because every time the government borrows money, it goes deeper into debt to spend that money. So as it spends the money, someone somewhere gets the money it's just spent. So someone somewhere in theory gets richer. Obviously, that money is going to poor people to pay for their social security or their Medicare or whatever. Uh, so they're not really getting richer. But that money goes through the chain and up and it ends up in the hands of the pharmaceutical companies or the technology companies or the wealthy of this world or somebody, maybe a foreign government, maybe the Chinese government or the Japanese government. It ends up in the hands of somebody somewhere who has produced the original service or good who's the wealth creator. So someone out there is getting richer as the government gets poorer, as they borrow more money. And of course, when they get richer, they look at asset allocation and they say, I only want so much in treasuries. I only want so much in equities. I only want so much in gold. I only want so much in this asset. I only want so much in heirlooms and so on, and so much in property. So they, they're asset allocating. So as the government goes deeper into debt, it means due to the asset allocation policies of billions of people around the planet, the price of assets in general will tend to rise. And obviously, uh, the rarer and more desired the asset is, the, fast, the further and faster it will rise. But of course, it does have an impact on retail prices as well, because there are, there are components in the retail price index, which are uh, consumer price index, which are rare. As an, one example is labor, the cost of labor. You know, the, the, the labor you put into, even though if you buy a, a pizza in your supermarket, it was almost certainly made by robots in a factory untouched by human hand but someone probably had to put it on the shelf someone had to drive it to the to the supermarket so there is a labor component um uh, which does mean that to some extent retail prices will be rising as well but they're not going to be rising as fast as the inflation of the fiat money uh the fiat uh, money is rising uh, it's it's around 10 percent a year at the moment that number is likely to rise uh so i would say the real inflation rate if you take everything into account the, the expansion of the monetary base on the planet is around 10 percent hey everyone sorry for interrupting i just wanted to extend a massive thank you uh to you for for listening and tuning in and, and for your support over these three years so we've had uh you know hundreds of uh, guests that we've welcomed on the podcast. We've uh, had millions of views with uh, hundreds of thousands of different people listening in. So uh, I just wanted to thank you. You know, I started this as a student uh, and now currently working. Uh, and I've always done this on the side just because I have a passion for it and I've enjoyed it. And probably similar to yourself, you listen to all these, uh, you know, different YouTube channels and podcasts with people uh, listening to different guests. That, that's how I started and I, I uh, just wanted to sort of take the plunge and be able to have the opportunity to speak to these people and, and you've made that happen. So th thank you very much. Uh, just myself, don't make any money from this and it's, it's really a pa passion project. So thanks for uh, supporting that, that passion of mine. Uh, if you wanted to support the channel, uh, all I ask is if you could like, subscribe, or even comment, you know, positive or negative feedback. I, I, I'm always <laughs> willing to take constructive criticism. Uh, I'd really appreciate that. Um, but otherwise, thanks so much. If you can believe it, only 14% of uh, our, our listeners actually subscribe to the podcast. So uh, yeah, if you can, great. If not, no problem at all. Uh, thanks for listening. And yep, let's get back to the show. Okay. Yeah, a lot, a lot to un, uh, unpack there. So do you, do you see the feds and other central banks moving to financial repression? So for example, forcing, you said pension funds or banks or other, you know, they've already done it to banks, but uh, uh, other owners to hold more government bonds, or do you think that they'll just uh, sort of try and have inflation a little bit higher than uh, where the cost of capital is, and then that will slowly re reduce the debt load? How, how do you see this playing out? Um, when banks or pension funds or individuals are forced to do something with their money that they wouldn't have done, that's by the government to basically buy government bonds, that's a bail-in. Bail-ins are not without precedent in history. It's happened many times in history in different types of ways. Um, I, I think there was a, a fairly famous one in Brazil uh, a few decades ago. Uh, and in a certain sense, the American government has done it in their own way in the past as well. Um, as an example, on the 30th of January 1934, the US government did a sort of bail-in when they 
acquired all the gold owned by the Federal Reserve, which don't forget the Federal Reserve is a private institution, it's not the government. They, by act of parliament, by act of government, uh, I think it was called, uh, I don't call the Banking Act or the Emergency Banking Act, so they basically forced the Federal Reserve to sell all of its gold to the government in return for paper. So the government or the treasury then owned the gold and it still does to this day. But the magic trick in that bail-in and much to the annoyance of the Federal Reserve was that they bought that gold at the official gold price, thirty, uh, which was at the time $20.67 an ounce. So the Federal Reserve got what they what's called gold notes, still on the balance sheet today, but those gold notes are redeemable at twenty dollars sixty seven per per ounce of gold. It's not redeemable at the new price. The very next day, the very next day, after that bail in of the Federal Reserve's gold, the government, uh, actually it was Mr. Roosevelt by a proclamation, resolved that the gold price should be increased by something like 47 percent, or if you like, the the dollar was devalued by forty seven percent. So the next day, gold was worth $35. All of that profit from $20.67 through to $35 accrued to the Treasury, to the government, and not to the Federal Reserve. Of course, the Federal Reserve wasn't the only person pissed off by this uh, effective bail-in. Uh, you can imagine the British, the French, the Swiss, and other dollar holders all around the world who, up until that time, had owned the lawful currency of the United States, which was effectively gold represented by dollars, now owed dollars represented by gold at half the price. <laughs> so nobody nobody was happy. Uh, you know, you, you could go back in time and look at the uh, ruminations of the British government at the time who were uh, wondering what they should do about it. But of course, uh, the question of an invasion of the United States was not, not going to happen. Uh, but, you know, the, the, that, that's an example of a bail-in. Uh, that was a very special one in a special way. But... Uh, governments do have a habit when they need money to force the bankers or other parties to do things. Uh, you know, I think in the Middle Ages, they would, uh, one of the ways of getting a bail in would be to uh, round up the Lombards and execute those who wouldn't lend them any more money. Yeah, so there's definitely the, op the option for, for that. Um... <laughs> I'm not, well, I'm not proposing that they ex execute the bankers this time around, but they'll have their ways if they want if they want to uh, force people to buy more treasuries. And the place you get that money is basically anyone who's got it. So if you've got money in the banking system, in a deposit, in a current account, in a money market fund, or somewhere where it's easily seizable, they can say, by law, you now have to put X into treasury bonds because that's how we have to fund the government. And that and pushes the can down right. the road. Yeah, do you think this is why maybe we've seen increases in the price of gold and, and silver and other precious metals, not just from a uh, you know individual standpoint, but also from a a government standpoint of uh, fear that the U.S. Treasuries are going to be worth less in the future, so these uh, countries are trying to diversify. Um. Yep. So absolutely. Uh, first of all, we we're, we're seeing higher than ever gold purchases by China and some other governments around the world. Uh, these central banks are staffed by highly intelligent people who know what's happen what's coming. Uh, they're not they're not sort of brain dead like we might like to think sometimes. I know there's a lot of criticism of central bank, but central banks are very bright, are uh, staffed by very bright people. They see what's coming with the dollar, and they would rather own gold than dollars today. And they don't want to smash crash the treasury market, so they'd like to do it gradually. But at the same time, they'd like to earn more gold. They don't want to make the gold price rise to the moon while they're still acquiring it. Otherwise, that would make it impossible to acquire. So they're doing, they're divesting themselves of treasuries very slowly. They're acquiring gold very slowly, but at a faster rate than in all of history. In fact, in 2023 was the second largest ever by tons purchases of gold by central banks. And in China's case, it was the highest ever purchases of gold by China. And in the first few months of this year, uh, China once again bought, we don't have the numbers for most, many countries, but China once again bought record amounts of gold uh, on a quarter on quarter basis. Um, but it's not just the Chinese government 
who's pushing up the gold. I, I think there's probably an even bigger factor in here is their traditional method of saving, which was by buying apartments, is out the window. Uh, property companies all over China are going bankrupt due to the oversupply of apartments. And there are now millions of unfinished apartments where people have paid their money for apartments, but they can't get them because they're not finished. So the middle class are not going to put their money into apartments as the way of saving money anymore. Uh, the stock market is crashing due to unfavorable policies from the central administration. Uh, in fact, the Chinese and Hong Kong stock markets are the worst performing stock markets in the world. So where are people in China going? Uh, they can't go to Bitcoin because that's banned in China. So I think they're going to the gold shops. And there are many tens of thousands of gold shops up and down China. And in a gold shop, in China, it's a much more bullion oriented way of purchasing than it is in the West. Now, you know, if you go into a Western uh, jewelry shop, you'll basically see the price of the item and you have to figure out, I wonder how that's calculated, how much gold there is. You can't really tell very easily. In a Chinese bullion shop or gold shop, uh, jewelry shop, you see posted on the wall, the gold price, which might be changing once a day or, or every few minute, or minutes, depending on their system. And on each item in the shop, you have two bits of information. The first bit of information is the amount of gold in pure grams. So whether it be a bar, an ornament, a bangle, or a coin, you have the number of grams of pure gold. That's your that's your first bit of information, the weight. And the second bit of information is what they call the labor charge. So when you want to know what something costs, you take the weight, which is displayed, multiply it by the price of the wall, add the labor charge, and that's what you're going to pay. So you know exactly where you stand, and you also know how much gold you're getting for your money in case you want to sell the item back. Now, if you go back to the shop with your gold item, the calculation isn't exactly the same because they pay you the price of the wall minus a discount, of course, there's always that, and they won't give you back your labor charge. But you know where you stand. So you know what the, the gold you just bought is worth and theoretically what it could be sold at, sold for. Although I don't think many people could go as far as doing that sort of calculation. It's, that's a bit more opaque to the average citizen. But certainly they know what they're paying for, what they're, what they're getting in terms of gold. So I think because they've got no other outlet for their savings, the middle class is turning to the gold jewellery shops. And I, I checked into this for evidence, and I looked at a number of jewellery chains in China. There's some very large jewellery chains, and their turnover is up massively uh, at the last reported results. In some cases, that's the results to 30th of September. In some cases, the results to the 30th of Dece 31st of December. Uh, but uh, a typical increase in turnover is 60% year on year. So that's hard and concrete evidence that the Chinese public are buying more gold items from the jewelry shops. But it's not the only place you can buy gold in China. Uh, they've got an application called WeChat, which every single Chinese person has got. It's the way they pay for things. It's the new CBDC uh, wallet, if you like, uh, for your social score, for your shopping. But on WeChat, you can also buy gold. And the minimum purchase there is just one gram. That's about $70, $80 worth. Okay, so they can buy on WeChat even the small guy who's not middle class can afford to buy a gram of gold on WeChat. And the other way which people can buy, and there's uh, over 10 million people are doing this via the Shanghai Gold Exchange, where the most popular bar is the 100 gram, 99.99% uh, pure bar. Uh, so anybody in China can go to the Shanghai Gold Exchange, either directly or via his bank and buy these 100 gram bars where the delivery time is T plus zero. In other words, same day delivery officially. Not if you go via your bank, of course, because it's got to be delivered to your bank, but but it's T, T plus zero. And if you sell it, it's T plus one. You get your money the next day. So people, people uh, th that's a much easier way to buy it because the price is much narrower. The bid ask is much narrower than going to the jewelry shop. And so it's perhaps the more sophisticated Chinese who would go to the Shanghai Gold Exchange to buy their gold. Uh, but again, turnover, uh, I haven't got the numbers, but I, I read somewhere that turnover is doing very well. Uh, but more importantly, we can judge the demand for gold out of Shanghai by the premium on the gold price over the spot price in the West. 
Uh, over the last month or so, the average premium was around $29, 25 $30. A couple of days ago, it spiked up to $90. Today, it's around $50 or $60. So the premium in Shanghai is higher than usual at the moment. What does this mean? It means that gold is being sucked into China from wherever it can come from. Uh, one of the major exporters of gold is Switzerland, who doesn't, buy, by the way, have any gold. Uh, we actually buy the... Uh, the, the, the uh, unrefined gold, refined it in Switzerland, then export it to China. Uh, it's a big, very big export to China. Uh, but they're, they're buying gold wherever they can get it uh, to sell on the Shanghai uh, Gold Exchange at a profit. And the profit at the moment is bigger than it's been for, well, for it, it's, it's rarely been as high as it is at the moment. So that's evidence that the Chinese public are buying gold. And I think that's what's causing the gold price to rise. Uh, but of course, we have the tailwind of the central banks buying. Um, and also we have the tailwind of the public at large knowing that the uh, inflation rates are not really going down. Um, I would say that's probably the last thing at the moment, but it will gather momentum over time. Uh, why do I say it's the last thing at the moment? The reason is this. Over the last year or so, we have seen nonstop liquidations of the Western, American and European gold ETFs, i.e. people are selling their gold ETF shares, cashing them in, which means the ETF itself has to sell the underlying gold. So the amount of gold held by the Western ETFs has been doing nothing but going down, 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 down. So Westerners aren't, at the moment, concerned by inflation enough to want to hold gold. Of course, there's the traditional gold bunks. There's plenty of them who are holding gold, but they're way outnumbered by the people who are saying, you know what, I've held this gold, this ETF, for 10 years. It hasn't done what's written on the tin. It's not gone up. I'm out of here. I'm going to buy one of the Mag7 or uh, Bitcoin or or whatever they think is the hottest story on the planet, which is moving. They want to, people want to buy things which are moving. They, you know, it's all, it, we're almost in, like in a, a mem world where it doesn't really matter if there's any value at all. It, it, value, valuations seem to, for many people, gone out the window. It's, hey, this stock's moving. Let's get into it while it's going up. You know, I want to be part of the crowd. I'm going to run with the lemmings. Uh, so people are selling their gold in the West uh, to buy other things. Now, that tide, if that tide does change, because they see inflation now heading up upwards, or simply because gold, the gold price is rising, that makes that become then it becomes mem like and people start to rush in the other direction. Uh, gold could go a very, very long way. Uh, but at the moment, we've got Western sellers and Eastern buyers. Okay. No, thanks. Thanks for explaining that. It's interesting. You don't think about the uh, the general public, but it does make sense in China why they're uh, why, why they're buying precious metals. But uh, yeah, Clive, thanks so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Uh, so my last question is: What is one message that people should take away from our conversation? I wouldn't keep too much money in bonds generally, or cash, or money market funds, or deposits. I would try and diversify into everything else. And I'm not going to say anything in particular. I'm not saying gold or silver, but yes, uh, property, equities, uh, heirlooms, things you might need next year, the presents for your grandchildren next year, anything you can lay your hands on to reduce your bank balance, provided you keep enough in the bank for your day-to-day -day needs and any unforeseen emergencies. And those who'd like to contact me can find me on LinkedIn, and I'm more than happy to answer any questions there. Perfect. I'll put that in the description below, but thanks again for your time. Thank you very much, Anthony. Hey, everyone. Thank you for listening. I really appreciate the support. Uh, if you got value out of this, I'd, I'd really uh, appreciate it if you could like, subscribe, or, or comment. You know, good or bad <laughs> feedback, I'm always open to that. But it really helps with the channel. Uh, as I said before, only about 14% of people actually subscribe to this channel. So if you were to that, it would really help. It could mean we could continue to grow. Um, if not, thanks for watching and see you on the next show. And you also might like uh, this video right here. All right, thanks again.